Once again, guys, thank you all for taking time to view this webinar this afternoon. We know this has been a tough situation for all of us over the past several weeks, so we want to make the most of the hand we've been dealt and add some insight into topics that you're either not familiar with or that you may not be able to spend as much time as you'd like on. So again, thank you. Um, as Scott mentioned, this webinar is going to cover Siemens control actuators and VA assemblies. So the first thing we're going to discuss today are control actuators. And control actuators are rotary devices that are either mounted to a burner, valves, dampers, or any other device that requires rotary motion. They're commonly used on both gas and oil burners. And Siemens offers several different varieties of these actuators. These different varieties include two position, which can also be referred to as float bump or, or position proportional. Uh, these really aren't that commonly used, uh, but we do offer them. Another type of actuator is the modulating or analog input actuator, and these are a bit more common. And then finally, we have our parallel positioning actuators, which are becoming more and more common all the time. And so we're going to go more in depth on some of these actuators in a little bit. Uh, but first, let's kind of look at some of the options that we have available. So as I stated before, Siemens offers several different types of control actuators uh, to meet specific application needs. So first, we're going to look at some two position or float bump actuators, the first of which being the SQM3 and the SQM4. So this is a line powered float bump actuator that is used to control fuel valves or air dampers on small to medium sized gas or oil burners. They're also CE approved, and they're not really used too often in the US. The next float bump actuator that we have is the SQN7. Again, these are line powered float bump actuators that are commonly used on small to medium capacity burners. Um, these aren't used too often in the US either, but they are CE approved. And then finally, we have the SQM10 actuator to round out our float bump type actuators. Uh, they are very similar to the SQM3 and the SQM7 in that they are line powered and they're used to control, again, small to medium sized burners. They're also CE approved, but they are not too commonly used in the US as well. So if you would like more information on these three specific actuators, please feel free to contact SCC or your local sales rep. I also mentioned that Siemens offers modulating or analog input actuators. There are actually a couple different versions that we offer, but we're first going to start with the SQM5. So the SQM5 is a modulating actuator that can either uh, you can either drive it with voltage, line voltage inputs, or you can modulate it with an analog input signal. It's also a standalone actuator, so it's not married to any specific system. And they're mainly used on industrial applications. They have multiple features that we'll cover more, uh, we'll cover more in depth in just a bit. And these are CE approved and UL and CSA listed. Next, we have the SQM4 actuator. Again, this is very similar to the SQM5 in that it is a modulating actuator that can be driven with either voltage or analog input signals. It's also a standalone actuator, so it's not married to any specific system. And the SQM4 is mainly used on industrial applications. In fact, it is the best actuator on the market for industrial applications. It too has some multiple features uh, that we're gonna dive into in a little bit. And much like the SQM5, it's also CE approved and UL and CSA listed. Finally, Siemens offers a variety of different types of parallel positioning actuators depending on the parallel positioning system being used. 
So first up is the STM33. The STM33 is a parallel positioning actuator that is married specifically to the LMV3 system. Much like the actuators that were shown earlier, these are also used to drive butterfly valves and, and dampers on gas and oil burners. These, uh, these specific actuators are now CE, UL, and CSA approved. Next, we have the SQM45 and SQM48. Again, these are parallel positioning actuators, but these are married specifically to the LMV5 system. Uh, one of the main differences between the SQM45 and the SQM48 is, is just the torque settings, and we're going to discuss that a little later. And these actuators are also CE, UL, and CSA approved. And then finally, we have the SQM9 actuator, uh, another parallel positioning actuator, and this one is also married to the LMV5 system, specifically for the LMV5, but it has a much greater torque value or a much greater torque rating than any actuator we've previously shown. And much like its predecessors, um, this is also CE, UL, and CSA approved. So, um, you know, now that we kind of have just an understanding of the different types of actuators that, that we offer for each specific, uh, like specific application, we're going to dive a little more in depth into several of these actuators. So let's start with the analog or modulating actuators and the SQM5. The SQM5 actuator has many different configurations and multiple setups. So no matter what type of input signal you're using, the following adjustment options are available on every single SQM5. This includes different torque ratings. So we can configure for multiple torque ranges between 90 and 400 inch pounds. Also, there are several different run times. Uh, for a 60 Hertz motor, Runtime ranges for a full 90 degree stroke fall between eight and 50 seconds. So eight to 50 seconds to drive from fully closed to fully open 90 degrees. Uh, there's also several different shaft size options and these include a 10 millimeter round, 3 eighths inch squared, 10 millimeter D and 14 millimeter round shaft sizes. It's, it's important to note that the resolution of the SQM5 is about 250 steps per 90 degrees of rotation, and the SQM5 can be made to hand, uh, can be made to meet NEMA 4 criteria with the addition of an SCC part number, and that part number being the AGA 55.5. All SQM5 actuators also have a manual auto switch. Um, when this switch is in the manual setting and line power is applied, you can drive the actuator up and down using the arrow keys shown to the left of this switch. When the switch is in the auto setting or automatic setting, you can drive the actuator open and close with either input line voltage signals or a modulating input signal. This OPE max min switch is also a very common feature on all SQM5 actuators. Most of the time, this switch is set to the OPE position. And when it's in the OPE position, the motor will drive open and closed based on the respective analog input signal. Setting this switch to the max position will ignore any input signal and drive the motor to the fully open position or the high fire setting. If you set the switch to the min position, it will ignore any input signal and drive the motor down to your low fire setting. There are also three limit switches on the SQM5, which we will discuss more in a minute. And there are three auxiliary switches. These auxiliary switches are dry contacts and are form C. So you can set these switches to any position you would like within the range of modulation. So from low fire to high fire. You'll also notice that there are four sets of numbers on the SQM5 drum. 
The leftmost set of numbers, those are strictly for relative positions. So they don't correlate, uh, they don't correlate to any limit switch settings. Cams one and two, which are the leftmost cams, the two leftmost cams, those two cams will share the second set of numbers from the left. Uh, so they share the second set of numbers for position indication. Cams three and four will share the third set of numbers. And cams five and six will share the fourth set of numbers. Really quick, I want to dive a bit deeper into the limit switches on the SQM5. Uh, the first switch from the left, which we will refer to as cam one, this sets your open position or your high fire setting. The second switch from the left sets your fully closed position. And the third switch from the left sets your low fire settings. So if you were going to use the SQM5 on a direct coupled setup, you would adjust cam one for your high fire position and you would adjust cam three for your low fire position. Well, we're gonna dive a bit deeper into direct coupling later in this presentation, but I really wanted to bring to your attention how you would adjust these different uh, position settings. So again, cam one is used for high fire and cam three is used for low fire. The SQM5 actuator can also be configured for clockwise or counterclockwise rotation, which we often refer to as either red scale or black scale. When we refer to red scale, looking at the gear end of the actuator, which you can see uh, right there in the picture is labeled, the motor will open from zero to 90 degrees in a clockwise rotation. When we refer to the black scale, Again, looking at the gear end of the actuator, the motor will be opening from zero to 90 degrees in a counterclockwise rotation. In the handouts tab of the webinar dashboard, you'll notice that there's a document labeled SQM5 setup. This document goes into more detail on the differences between red scale and black scale. And for the rest of this slide, we're actually going to be referencing this document quite a bit. So, um, one thing that's also important to note is the SQM5 is field reversible. And right now I'm going to walk you through the four main steps for reversing rotation in the field. So the first thing that you need to look at or that you'll need to adjust is the wiring on the potentiometer of the SQM5. So from top to bottom, you'll notice that the wiring is in a sequence of brown, black, blue. When, when the potentiometer is wired in this sequence, the SQM5 is set up for black scale. And in order to readjust this for red scale, you would simply swap the brown and blue wires so that the sequence from top to bottom would then read blue, black, brown. The next step to switching the uh, rotation of the SQM5 would be adjusting the potentiometer itself. So in the diagram here, you'll notice that the arrow on the potentiometer is pointing towards the right. This corresponds to black scale wiring. If you would like to configure the motor for red scale, you will need to adjust the potentiometer so that the arrow is pointing in the upward position. And it should actually be pointing directly at the screw highlighted here in the image. The third configuration that needs to take place is to that of the motor leads. Now the motor leads consist of two blue wires crimped together and two black wires crimped together. These wires come already pre-installed on the motor, um, so you don't need to add them at all. But when you're configuring for black scale, the double black wires should run to terminal 12 and the double blue wires should run to terminal 21. So like the configuration on the, the picture to the left there. Now, when you configure for red scale, the wire should be swapped. So the double blue wire would actually go to terminal 12 and the double black wire would go to terminal 21. So similar um, setup to the right picture there. And then finally, the last adjustment we would need to make is to the position ind indicators on each cam. So you'll notice on the diagram to the right here that there are single pointer and double pointer indicators. 
And those, uh, the single and double pointers are the notches on the cams themselves. So on the motors configured for black scale, we will be using the single pointer indicators and they need to be set to the black numbers on the number scale, much like the top image there. And when configuring for red scale, we will need to use the double pointer indicators and those double pointer indicators need to be set to the red numbers on the number scale, much like the bottom picture there. And so those are the four simple settings that need to be adjusted to configure clockwise or counterclockwise rotation on the SQM5. Um, again, these are all reiterated in that SQM5 setup document under the handouts tab. So if you guys want to download that or keep it for yourselves, it could come in handy. We come really uh, much in handy down the, down the road in the future. One more thing I quickly wanted to go over uh, is how to remove the cover of the SQM5. But more importantly, I want to show you how to put the cover back on. So here's a quick video that shows the proper procedure for both. And now when you're putting the cover back on, you want to make sure that the slots uh, of the actuator top go into the grooves on the actuator body along the sides and the top. And then the screws should just fall right into place. So now that we've covered some basic functions that pertain to all SQM5 actuators, I wanna dive into a couple specific models of the SQM5. The first being the four to 20 milliamp analog input option or the G board. The G board can be operated as a float bump actuator with voltage inputs when the manual auto switch is set to the auto position. So moving from right to left across the voltage terminals outlined here, the L terminal is where you would supply line voltage. This line voltage is used to drive the motor uh, when the manual auto switch is in the manual position. And it's also used to power the motor when an analog input signal is introduced. The Z terminal is associated with the setting of cam two. So it will bring the actuator down to its closed position. The A terminal is associated with the setting of cam one. So it will bring the actuator up to the open position or to the high fire setting. The ZL terminal is associated with the setting of cam three, uh, which will drive the actuator down to your low fire position. The N terminal, that's just where you would wire in your neutral. And then there's the LR terminal. When this terminal is powered, that is what allows the actuator to modulate with a given analog input signal. So this is essentially the release to modulate function of the SQM5. Something very important to keep in mind is that you can only power one of these voltage terminals at a time. If you supply line voltage to more than one of these input terminals, you actually risk damaging the motor. So with power, let's say we have power on the LR terminal, the manual auto switch is in auto for automatic, and the OPE max min switch, which I discussed earlier, let's say that's in the OPE position. The G board can then actually operate as a modulating actuator best based on the appropriate input signal. And the G board runs strictly on four to 20 milliamp inputs uh, highlighted here. These are the analog inputs. So if we were to run a four to 20 uh, analog input signal to this motor, the positive part of that signal would wire into the Y plus terminal and the negative part of that signal would wire into the Y minus terminal. It's important to note that when modulating, the actuator will drive between the range set by cam one and cam three. So between high fire and low fire. If the OPE max min switch we're set to either the max or min position, then as I mentioned before, the analog input signal would be ignored and the actuator would drive to the corresponding open or closed position. One more feature I wanna point out here are the max and min pots. These max and min pots 
are used to fine tune your modulating range. So for instance, if you wanted to modulate high fire and low fire between 20 degrees and 70 degrees as opposed to zero and 90 degrees, obviously first you would adjust your limit switches, but then you can adjust these pots to scale your four to 20 milliamp input signal so that they only respond or so that it scales a signal between 20 and 70 degrees. So that's the G board. The next SQM5 actuator I want to discuss is the multi-input board or the Z board. Uh, the Z board, much like the, the G board, can be operated as a float bump actuator with voltage inputs, uh, with multiple voltage inputs when the manual auto switch is set to the auto position. So looking at the voltage input terminals outlined here, again, the L terminal is where you would supply line voltage this is used to drive the motor in manual mode, and it's used to power the motor when an analog input signal is introduced. The Z terminal, again, associated with the setting of CAM2, will bring you down to the fully closed position. The A terminal is associated with CAM1, so applying power on there will bring you up to your open position or your high fire position. And the ZL terminal is associated with the setting of CAM3, so that will drive you down to your low fire position. I also wanted to quickly point out the P terminal, which is right next to the L terminal to the left of that. Uh, we're going to get into more specific details on that in a few minutes here, but I just want to make you aware of it. And then we have the N terminal, which is again for your neutral. The L1 terminal, shown all the way to the left, is very similar to the LR terminal in that uh, when this power, when this terminal is powered, it allows the actuator to modulate with a given analog input signal. So again, it's a release to modulate function. Um, one more thing to take note of, please keep in mind, you can only power one of these voltage terminals at, at a time. If you power, if you supply line voltage to more than one of these terminals at once, you could risk damaging the motor. So let's assume we have power on the L1 terminal. Uh, our motors, our, our switch is in automatic mode and the OPE maximum switch is in the OP position. Now the Z board can operate as a modulating actuator based on the appropriate input signal. And the special thing about the Z board is that it can take multiple input signals, multiple analog input signals. So the negative parts of these signals are always going to be terminated onto the M terminals. Uh, if you were wanting to modulate with a 4 to 20 milliamp input signal, then you would terminate the positive end of that signal to the Y3 terminal. If you wanted to modulate with a 0 to 10 volt input signal, you would terminate the positive end of that signal to Y2. And if you wanted to modulate with a 0 to 135 ohm input signal, you would terminate on the Y0 and U4 terminals to complete that circuitry. Um, again, it's important to note when modulating, in, uh, when modulating with any analog input signal, um, the range of modulation is going to be between CAM1 and CAM3, so high and low fire again. Another special thing about the Z board is that it also allows for analog output signals, which are shown here. So again, the negative ends of these signals, uh, the output signal will be terminated to the M terminal. All three of those M terminals, uh, they are all jumpered together internally on the board. So um, that they're, all, they're all internally jumpered, they're all going to the same place. But if you would like to output a four to 20 milliamp signal, you would terminate the positive end of that lead to terminal U3. And if you would like to output a zero to 10 volt signal, you would terminate the positive end of that lead to the U1 terminal. So in a second here, you're gonna notice that the OPE maximum switch is located on a different spot on the board. Uh, this is actually on the other side of the circuit board, but the functionality remains the same. You also notice that the max and min pots are on the other side of this circuit board as well. Um, again, these are just used to fine tune your modulating range, but in between each of them, you'll notice that there is a POS pot. 
and we refer to that as the p-pot. And what that does is when you supply line voltage to that P terminal I mentioned earlier, the actuator will actually, again, ignore any input signals and drive to a position specified by this pot. And the range of that pot can be set um, between the range set by CAM1 and CAM3. So you can set the range of that pot anywhere between high fire and low fire. Um, you know, one possible use for this terminal would be that if your system went into alarm and you wanted the actuator to drive to a specific predetermined position, uh, you can supply power to that P terminal and, and boom, it, it drives to that position, that specific position. One last feature I wanted to point out here are the J1 and J2 jumpers. The J1 jumper is used for linearization uh, or it's used to linearize the initial steep flow curve that you see with a butterfly valve. And the J2 jumper is used for parallel operation or master-slave operation. So if you would like to know more details regarding these functions, uh, please feel free to contact your SEC sales rep and they'll be more than happy to assist. So that was an in-depth look at the SQM5 actuator. Now we're going to dive a little deeper into the other modulating actuator, which is the SQM4 Synchro. So as I mentioned earlier, the SQM4 Synchro is the best valued actuator on the market for industrial applications, for industrial applications. Similar to the SQM5, the SQM4 has many different configurations and multiple setups. So no matter what type of input signal you're using, these following options are available on every single SQM4 synchro actuator. This includes torque. So you can configure for multiple different torque ranges between 45 and 160 inch pounds. There's also several different run times. For a 60 hertz motor, the opening time from zero to 90 degrees of rotation ranges from 12 to 54 seconds. And there's also a few different shaft sizes. Uh, these include a 10 millimeter keyed, a 3 8 inch squared, a 10 millimeter D, and a 14 millimeter keyed shaft. One other thing that's important to note is that the resolution of the SQM4 is about 130 steps per 90 degrees of rotation. Um, and then also the SQM4 comes in both clockwise and counterclockwise rotation. Unlike the SQM5, however, rotation is not field reversible, but we do offer two different types of SQM4 synchro actuators, the SQM40 and the SQM41. The SQM40 has counterclockwise rotation when opening from zero to 90 degrees, and the SQM41 has clockwise rotation when opening from zero to 90 degrees. One last unique feature is that the SQM4 Synchro is actually NEMA 4 rated right out of the box. So there's no additional hardware kits you need, no additional, hard, uh, yeah, no additional hardware, no additional kits. It's, it's NEMA 4 out of the box. So <clears throat> although the SQM40 and the SQM41 have different directions of rotation, they both still use the same actuator housing. So to accommodate for this, the SQM40 and SQM41 use different positioning scales. So the scale that you see here, this is silk screened onto the inside of every SQM4 actuator near the camshaft. So notice the single notch. You notice that there's single notch and double notch, uh, double notches on the, the camshaft there. The single notches are used on the SQM40. So, so the SQM40 uses single notches and use the outside scale of numbers for position indication. Whereas the SQM41 uses the double notches and the inside scale of numbers for position indication. Depending on the model of the SQM4 actuator being used, there are two to three limit switches uh, that, that you'll have at your disposal. The functions of, the, of these limit switches include settings for high fire, low fire, closed position, 
and ignition positions, just to name a few. We'll elaborate on these again in a minute, uh, but I wanted to bring them to your attention. And then there's also one to two auxiliary switches that you'll have at your disposal. Again, the number of these switches or the amount of switches that you have will come down to the model of the actuator being used. But these auxiliary switches, they are dry contact, they're form C, and you can set them to any position you would like within the range of modulation. And before we move on, I wanna dive in again into the limit switches on the SQM4 actuator or the SQM4 synchro actuator. So highlighted in this picture, um, you'll see that all the cams have an adjustable screw. So if you look at that blue cam there with the, the red box around it, you'll see there's a white plastic screw in there. You can adjust that screw with a small screwdriver and adjusting that will actually change the limit position of each of the cams. So the first cam that I really wanna highlight is the red cam. This red cam sets the open position or the high fire position on every SQM4 synchro actuator. The second cam I wanna to bring to your attention is the black cam. This black cam sets the low fire position on every modulating SQM4 synchro actuator. So if you were to use, um, if you were to use this type of actuator on a direct coupled setup, you would adjust the red cam for your high fire position and you would adjust the black cam for your low fire position. And again, a little bit later, we're gonna dive deeper into direct coupling. Um, but again, I just wanted to bring to your attention uh, how you would adjust these different position settings. So red cam used for high fire, black cam used for low fire. So now that we've covered some basic functions that pertain to all SQM4 actuators, I wanna dive into a more commonly used version of the SQM4 synchro, and that being the four to 20 milliamp analog input option or the five board. I also wanna make a note that we place this terminal sticker on every SQM4 synchro actuator that has a five board. So looking at the top portion of this sticker, we see that the, the five board can actually be used as a float bump actuator with voltage inputs. So your neutral will get wired into terminal X2-8. And if you were to supply line voltage to terminal X2-2, this would drive the actuator to your high fire setting. Supplying voltage to terminal X2-7 would drive the actuator to the low fire setting. And supplying voltage to terminal X2-9 would allow the actuator to modulate with a given analog input signal. So it's again, the release to modulate function. Just like the SQM5, it's really important to note that you can only power one of these voltage terminals at a time. If you supply voltage to more than one of these input terminals, you'll risk damaging the motor. So let's assume we have voltage being supplied to the X2-9 terminal. Now the five board can actually operate as a modulating actuator based on the appropriate input signal. And the five board strictly works with four to 20 milliamp inputs. So here are the analog input terminals. So if we were to modulate this with a four to 20 milliamp signal, the positive end of this signal would be wired into terminal X1-1 and the negative part of this signal would wire into terminal X1-2. One more feature that I wanna point out are the max and min pots shown here. Uh, these max and min pots are, again, they're just used to fine tune your modulating range if you were to, um, if you were to scale down your, mod, your high fire and low fire from zero to 90 degrees, if you were to narrow that down. So there, there's a number of other types of modulating SQM4 actuators available. And these include analog input signals of two to 10 volts and zero to 135 ohms. There's also some SQM4 synchros uh, that act strictly as float bump actuators. It, so if you would like to know more, or you have any questions on these specific models, please don't hesitate to contact your SEC sales rep. 
One other thing is that uh, the SQM4 Synchro can also use the following additional hardware, that being the AGA 57.5 mounting bracket. And this mounting bracket can actually be used to mount any one of our SQM4 actuators in place of some of our competitors' actuators. So here's a quick bottom view and side view of the SQM4 mounted to this AGA 57.5 bracket. Um, and this, this kind of concludes the modulating, uh, ma modulating analog input section of the, of the presentation. We've gone into detail on, on the SQM5 and SQM4, which are really commonly used. And now we're going to dig a bit deeper into some of the parallel positioning actuators. So first up is the SQM33. And as I mentioned earlier, the SQM33 is married strictly to the LMV3 system. There's two torque ranges that the SQM33 comes in, those being 27 inch pounds and 90 inch pounds. The actuators are also pre-wired with a 12 foot cable, and you can configure the direction of rotation through the LMV3 system. So if you look at the LMV3 parameters list to the right, you'll notice that parameter 602 or 609 will control the direction of rotation of the actuator. Likewise, you can configure the referencing of the actuator through the LMV3 system with parameter 601 or 608. And now, <clears throat> some of you may be asking, what do I mean by referencing? Well, there's an optical sensor inside the SQM33 and it's looking at the gears, the gearbox inside the actuator. And once a specific set of gears crosses this optical sensor, the actuator is able to find its home position. Um, it's able to find a home position, so it uses it as a referencing. But in order to do this, the actuator needs to rotate beyond the zero to 90 degree operating window. So in the, in the diagram to the right, um, in the diagram to the right of the LMV3 parameters, you'll notice that some lines, there's a couple of lines that are outside of this nine o'clock and noon 90 degree window. These are the positions that the SQM33 must reference to after every startup and after every fault. So something to keep in mind is when you are putting this actuator on a valve, you need to make sure that the valve is able to reference outside of this window. Um, and the SQM33 only needs to reference towards one of these spots. It doesn't need to go towards both of them. So the valve either needs to move past the nine o'clock position or past the noon position. Um, another important point, don't open the cover on the SQM33. There's no reason to. Um, doing so can actually damage the internals of the actuator and then it won't be able to reference properly anymore and just your LMV3 system won't be able to function. So don't open the cover. Um, and one other thing is that the SQM33 can be made to meet NEMA4 criteria with the addition of the following SEC part number. Uh, that is the BR-N4-SQM33. Now we're gonna take a look at some parallel positioning actuators associated with the LMV5 system, and those being the SQM45 and the SQM48. Again, these are strictly married to the LMV5 uh, operating system, and they come in three different torque ranges. The SQM45 is rated for 27 inch pounds and is mainly used on gas valves, and the SQM48 comes in torque ranges of 177 and, and 310 inch pounds. So these are mainly used to control air. These actuators don't come pre-wired, but instead they run off of CAN bus and they must run off of CAN bus. CAN bus is a specifically made shielded cable with a twisted pair. Um, if you were to try to use these actuators by wiring, them up, by wiring them up with anything other than CAN bus, you'll run into numerous feedback faults and the LMV5 won't be able to operate. As you can see to the image to the right, 
CAN bus is also a daisy chain connection. So it's not a loop, it's not a star, it's all daisy chain. Um, and we also, we sell CAN bus in spools of 100 or 500 feet. Uh, so you would just trim it to the proper length that you would need for whatever you're trying to hook up to or whatever length you need for the application. You can also configure the direction of rotation of these actuators through the LMB5 system using the parameter direction rote, which stands for direction of rotation. These actuators also have the ability to be addressed, and this is so that the LMV5 system knows how to control each one. It's actually a very simple process to address each actuator. What you would do is you first go to the param to an LMV5 parameter called addressing, and it would have to pertain specifically to uh, the actuators themselves. And then you select what you want the actuator to be addressed for. Do you want it for air, gas, oil, uh, auxiliary for a special type function. Finally, once you select, once you select the, um, what you want to be addressed for, you would press the red address button on the inside of the actuator itself. A successfully addressed SQM45 or 48 actuator will have a blinking LED light. And the number of blinks from this LED relates to what the, ad, what the actuator is addressed for. So if it's one blink, it'd be for air, two blinks is for gas, three blinks is for oil, et cetera. Finally, both the SQM45 and 48 can be made to meet NEMA4 criteria with the following part numbers. Uh, you'll notice it's the same part number for the SQM33 NEMA4 kit, except the two numbers are changed at the end to 45 or 48. And finally, we have the SQM9 actuator, which is the largest of the control actuators that we're going to discuss today. This actuator is also married to strictly the LMV5 system, and it has a torque range of 600 inch pounds. So it's the largest torque of any actuator we've discussed. Since it's part of the LMV5 system, it also needs to be wired up using CAN bus. You can configure the direction of rotation and you can address the actuator both through the LMV5 system itself. The SQM9 is also NEMA4 straight out of the box. So no additional hardware, no additional kit. So it's NEMA4 right out of the box. Um, and that wraps up the, I mean, that wraps up the, the parallel positioning actuators associated with the LMV5. And actually, our whole control actuator part of the presentation. And what this has been doing is this has been setting us up for the next part of our presentation, in which we are going to discuss uh, valve actuator assemblies and VA assemblies. Or valve actuator assemblies, uh, we also refer them to them as VA assemblies. So a VA assembly is a combination of Siemens products. It's a Siemens actuator mounted to a Siemens valve with the help of a coupling and some standoffs. Like other valve actuator assemblies, our VA assemblies are used to control the flow of fuel or air into a system. Siemens VA assemblies are also machined precisely to allow the use of a solid shaft coupling and being able to use this solid shaft coupling allows for direct coupling, which results in a snug pinned positive connection. Now, there's several advantages to using direct coupling as opposed to linkage. One of those is that linkage is prone to hysteresis and slippage. Uh, direct coupling eliminates this hysteresis and the possibility of slipping. Linkage can also be difficult to adjust. Uh, when, when you're direct coupled using one of our VAs, there's nothing to adjust besides the cam positions on the control actuators. And since there's nothing to adjust or tinker with, this greatly discourages tampering with the current system setup. Also, as I mentioned previously, direct coupling creates a pinned positive connection. 
So in addition to eliminating the possibility of slippage, this pin connection can actually use the actuator position as a reliable indicator of valve position, which is an added safety benefit. As a quick side note, uh, I just want to mention that the LMV parallel positioning actuators, so the SQM33, SQM45, and SQM48, those are constantly sending feedback signals to the LMV chassis, um, which is then in turn confirming, confirming position in a much similar manner. So in short, direct coupling has many advantages over linkage, and it's a much safer option. So here are a couple examples of what not to do when it comes to direct coupling. You'll see the picture on the left is actually using a pipe nipple with some screws in it. Uh, that is definitely not the best alternative. And the picture on the right isn't much better. It's just a solid piece of metal with some screws thrown in it as well. So uh, these are definitely not precise. They're definitely not the most uh, you know, accurate methods of using direct coupling. Here is the Siemens version of direct coupling using or, or being used on one of our VA assemblies. And as you can see, it's much more precise. All of our components use precision machining, which allows us to fit all the parts together in one orderly setup. This, you'll see that the solid shaft coupling actually fits very snug over the actuator and valve stem. And then the standoffs, are there to also provide some additional support. Siemens actually offers a variety of valve actuator assemblies. We have VAs that mount our actuators to our VKG threaded butterfly valves. We have VAs that consist of our VKF flanged butterfly valves. We have VAs that consists of our VKP proportional control valve. We also have VAs that mount our actuators to a variety of special type wafer butterfly valves. And there's also VAs that are able to mount our actuators to Hawk oil valves. So there's a multitude of possibilities out there for VA assemblies. So we're gonna wrap things up really quick. Uh, let's briefly reiterate what we've covered today. We discussed the three different types of control actuators that Siemens offers. Those being float bump or two position, modulating or analog, and parallel positioning. We also looked at a few actuator examples that Siemens offers from each group. Specifically, we took an in-depth look at the SQM5 actuator and we looked at the best valued actuator for the industrial market, the SQM4 Synchro. We also dove deeper into actuators that are used on each of the Siemens parallel positioning systems, those being the SQM33, the SQM45, and the SQM48. And finally, we tied everything together with Siemens valve assemblies or VA assemblies. With Siemens VA assemblies, we're able to take advantage of direct coupling, which has more advantages, is more reliable, and is much safer than linkage. So with that, I wanna thank you all for attending again, and now I'm going to hand things back over to Scott, who will start our Q&A session with some of the questions that we've, or that you guys have been asking throughout the presentation. All right, thanks, Steve. Um, uh, thanks for that for that for that content. Um, we'll now go into kind of a live Q and A session. Um, we did get some um, some questions from the group, um, and to start off um, on the valve actuator assemblies, there's a black band on the coupling, and they wanted to ask, do I do they need that band to keep the coupling together, or what is that band used for? Yes, that's a that's a good question. Uh, that band, it's actually a rubber band, and it's used during the assembly process to allow us to be as accurate as possible when we're aligning the actuator shaft to the coupling itself. So once everything is actually aligned and secured, 
and we have a complete VA assembly, that rubber band isn't necessarily needed anymore. So if we were to somehow come off in the field, uh, that, that's completely fine. All right. Next one, um, for a valve actuator assembly, can I turn the actuator orientation on the valve? That, that's a good question. Um, you are actually able to change the orientation of a VA assembly. And the way you do that is, is we have a special part number. So at the end of a given VA assembly part number, well, we can add a dash 90, a dash 80, or a dash 270 to the end of that part number. And then that will adjust the actuator uh, for the desired orientation. Okay, okay, good. Um, and next one here, um, on the SQM5, um, you had talked about the OPE min-max switch. And, and what's that usually used for? So, it's, I mean, aside from, um, you know, allowing the, the SQM5 to modulate with an analog input signal, it's mainly used to replicate an analog signal that goes through the actuator control board. So the max setting is actually replicating a 20 milliamp signal. And then the min setting is actually replicating a four milliamp signal. So um, if the OPE switch were to work uh, in terms of like driving the actuator down, open and close, the rest of the control board should work. And then once we know that the circuit board works, it's pretty straightforward in adjusting the min and max potentiometers uh, to adjust for your input scaling. So that's kind of the second factor that's built into that switch. Yeah. Nice, yeah, good, good response. Thanks, Steve. Um, next one here, um, you, know, you talked a lot about you know, direct coupling. Um, are we able to use these actuators for a, for a linkage? That's a great question. Um, yes, you can use them for linkage. So depending on the valve, or damper that you're mounting to. We have a lineup of crank arm kits and, and bracket kits for different linkage setups. So if you'd like to get into more specifics on those, uh, feel free to contact your SEC sales rep. All right. Um, I think one of the one of the last ones here um, is on, on the LMV actuators. So the LMV3 and LMV5, you had talked about the NEMA 4 kits. Mm -hmm. Are we able to add these in the field um, or do they have to be ordered that way? So you can order them with NEMA 4 kits, but you can also add a kit, a NEMA 4 kit to the actuator in the field. Um, if you want more details on that, again, I would, I would contact your SEC sales rep and, and they'll give you more details on that. Okay. All right, yeah, that's, that's very useful there. Um, okay, well, that's, I, th I think that's all the, all the time that we have for today. Um, if there are any additional questions, you know, that, that come to you, um, yeah, feel free to contact your SEC account manager, um, or if you're, if you're not sure who that account manager is, um, you can always send a note to marketing at sccombustion.com. Uh, we'll get you an answer. We'll get you in touch, um, you know, with the correct person there. Um, a link to this recorded webinar, uh, will be sent to your email tomorrow. Um, as well as um, all of our webinars are actually on our YouTube channel. Um, so, so we're keeping a lot of information on our YouTube channel there. Um, and there's, yeah, there's all sorts, of, all sorts of shorter videos too, you know, troubleshooting videos or, um, or just kind of quick, um, quick information. Um, so, yeah, so thanks for tuning in today. Um, we wish uh, safety upon everybody and, um, and let's kind of get these, through these unique times together and um, and we'll, we'll see you guys soon. Yeah, I just wanna say again, you know, thank you Scott for, for moderating this webinar today and, and thank you again to everyone who tuned in for this webinar. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and continue to stay healthy and stay safe.